Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. I welcome you once again to Fusion Mobile e-learning platform. My name is Oke Buno and the subject for us is agricultural science. The topic we'll be considering in this lesson is fish farming. And under fish farming, we'll look at the following subheadings. Definition and importance of fish farming. Factors necessary for sighting a fish pond, classification of fishes, construction of a fish pond, maintenance of a fish pond, processing and preservation of fish, and finally, we'll look at the methods of harvesting fish. Fish farming can be defined simply as the act of rearing fishes or selected um, fishes varieties of fishes okay selected varieties of fishes rearing selected okay let's go again fish farming is the act of rearing selected fishes okay under controlled scientific environments in enclosed water bodies such as ponds, rivers, streams and harvesting these fishes when they reach maturity for the purpose of sale or consumption. Again, fish farming is simply the act of rearing selected varieties of fishes under scientifically controlled environment within enclosed water bodies such as ponds, rivers, streams and when these fishes reach maturity they are harvested that is they are collected for the purpose of sale or consumption that is fish farming. Now, when we talk about fish farming, a number of things come to mind, a number of terms come to mind, terms like uh, fingerlings, terms like uh, the fish pond, terms like uh, the um, uh, uh, fishing uh, implements and all of that. So we're going to look briefly at the terms that are Con that, that should be considered when we're talking about fish farming. All right, so let's quickly look at a number of terms that, uh, that easily come to mind when we talk about fish farming. The first is fingerlings. What do we mean by fingerlings? Fingerlings are just like you have seedlings or like you have, um, yes, seedlings in terms of crops. You have fingerlings in terms of fishes. The fingerlings are the little or the baby fishes that are introduced into the fish pond to be reared. So the fingerlings simply are the those tiny, tiny fishes that you buy maybe from um, somewhere and then you introduce it into your own fish pond to rear them. You call those fingerlings. Fisheries. Fisheries is simply the study of, uh, of fish or fishes, as the case may be. So the scientific study of fish, fishes, is known as fishery. You can actually study fishery the same way you study botany or zoology. Then. When we talk about fish, fish is a group of, um, of fish, okay, a, a, when you consider fish as a, as a species, that is a single, singular species, irrespective of the number, they could be hundred, they could be a thousand, but as long as it is the same species. You don't say fishes, you say fish. 
you say fishes when you are considering different species of fishes. For instance, if we are talking about tilapia and then we are talking about titles, fine, you can say fishes. But if you are considering just tilapia, even if it's a thousand of them, you only say fish. So, now, uh, of course, that uh, quickly brings us to this and, of course, uh, to this also, okay, to this. So, you can actually say a school of fish, okay, or a school of fishes, as the case may be. You can as well say a fry of fish or a fry of fishes. When you talk about school of fish, you're talking about many of them maybe swimming together. They could be mothers and their offsprings, fathers and their offsprings. I mean, an entire uh, selected number of, uh, of them, okay? swimming together you call them school and then you talk about fry when it's just the tiny fishes okay or tiny fish okay when they are grouped together or swimming together and they are babies that is tiny baby fishes okay you can call them fry a fry of fish if it's a singular species or a fry of fishes if they are different species swimming together same goes for school a school of fish, a school of fishes, and of course, remember, this has to do with all, okay, both old, old, and young. This one has only to do with baby, okay, fishes. Okay, baby fish or baby fishes. Now, when we talk about pond, pond is that enclosed body of water. Okay, it can be, um, it can be a stream, it can be a pond, it, it, you can call it a pond, yes. It can be a lake, it can be a river, okay. That enclosed body of water is what you call pond. And within the enclosed body of water, what you do there is that you rear your fish or fishes, okay? Body of water. And then when we talk about gears, gears are the implements, the equipments that you used, that you use in fishing, okay? Those equipment, uh, implements used you have the trawlers, you have the fishing nets, you have the fish, the hook and line and a number of them, okay? You call them gears. And then hatchery. Hatchery is where you keep your tiny baby fishes. You keep the tiny baby fishes, take care of them before transferring them to a bigger pond. Before transferring them to a bigger pond where they can... Uh, where they can now continue their growth process. And then when we talk about aquaculture, aquaculture refers to the study of fish, the study of uh, the study and the rearing of fish. Okay? And uh, we also talk about the study and rearing of other aquatic animals. Not just talking about fish now, we can also bring into the picture uh, crabs, we can bring into the picture um, shrimps, you know, all these other uh, crayfish, good, all these other animals that can be reared within the water environment for economic purposes we talk about aquaculture but we are not talking about aquaculture in this very lesson our focus is on fish so we will continue um, our study of fish farming 
okay, by looking at the importance. What importance does fish farming have on the economy? Okay. Talking about fish farming now and its importance, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be said okay, that fish is a better source of protein than red meat. Yes, fish is a better source of protein than red meat. And that is to say that fish provides us with quality protein. Quality protein. Away from that, fish can also serve as a source of revenue generation, both to the individual who is involved in fish farming and also to the nation as, I mean, as a whole. A nation can decide, for instance, to, to, to have or to support the little farmers such that the fish, the, 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 the farming uh, process can be very well extended to the point where these uh, products or fish products can actually be exported and the nation can earn foreign exchange on, on it. And then fish has also been found very useful in the medical environment. A number of, uh, for instance, fish oil, a lot of us growing up, we, we must, a lot of us growing up should remember that cod liver oil. You know cod liver oil? I'm sure you drank it when you were a little baby. You can ask your mom. Okay, most of us did. What does, what, what, I mean, what did that help us achieve? It helped to strengthen the bones. It helped to, you know, make us um, improve our immune systems and all of that. And away from that, there are other, uh, there are other uh, ways, okay, that fish have been used in the pharmaceutical industries. And going further, fish, is also, or rather, fish farming, okay, has also been found very useful in the edu educational environments. Talking about fishery, for instance, fishery, do you know how many thousands of Nigerian uh, students are studying fishery as we talk, I mean, as you watch this video? And of course, it's something you might even want to consider, okay, in, for, for a higher degree and talk about the lecturers that are involved in teaching these. A lot of uh, employment opportunities are involved, okay, talking about fish farming. Now, we will go on to look at the factors that are necessary when considering fish farming. Factors that are necessary for sighting of fish pond. That's the next Thing to consider. All right, You're welcome once again as we proceed with our study of fish farming. Now we're looking at the factors that are necessary when we have to consider sighting a fish pond. Sighting a fish pond can be a little bit of a tedious task because you have to make sure that all the factors or all the necessary conditions are right in order to enjoy whatever business you are setting up. Now, one of the first things you must consider when sighting a fish pond is water supply. The water that you want to use for your fish pond, is it going to be from a river? Is it going to be from a stream? Is it going to be from a pond? Now, you must note that the water supply for your fish pond must be abundant and it must be such that the water is, uh, that, the, that the pond itself is situated in such a way that water can come in and water can go out, okay, so that the water is not stagnated. Most probably, you can sight your fish pond across 
the water body, let's say the water is flowing, the stream, for instance, is flowing from, uh, from, let's say this point is A and this point is B. So you see the stream flowing. You can sight your fish pond somewhere around here so that, okay, as the water flows from point A to point B, it's continues it continues to cleanse the pond without stagnating the water within the pond okay and the water must be abundant soil in the area the area where you want to site your fish pond again should be such that does not whether it's raining season whether it is raining season or dry season whether it is rainy season or dry season Please take note. Whether it is rainy season or dry season, that particular portion of land that you have chosen will not go dry. And the water does not percolate through the soil and disappear. Okay, So always that very portion of land should be able to hold water. And apart from being able to hold water, it should also be a fertile soil. So you see, two things are involved here. The soil should be fertile, one, and it should be um, able to hold what, able to retain water. Now, why should the soil be fertile? Fishes usually feed on the natural food called planktons. Planktons. Now, these planktons are very um, little uh, weed, okay, that's, that grow naturally. They are, they are little um, plants, okay, they are little plants, let's not call them weeds, okay, they are little plants that grow in water bodies. You can actually uh, increase their growth by spray, spreading fertilizers across the water body, so it, that helps to uh, keep them growing a lot more so that the fishes can have abundant food. So if the soil is not fertile, the nutrients can be drained off the soil. So the soil should be able to retain water, it should be fertile enough to support the growth of planktons. Then again, we look at the vegetation. Where you want to do your fish pond, should, the vegetation should be low enough so as not to stress you considerably in felling of trees and trying to do a lot of uh, removing of stumps from the grounds and all of that. You should just be able to do a little bit of weeding and clearing and then maybe digging up without stressing a whole lot and you have your fish pond. So vegetation should not be too thick and tall trees that will require removing stumps and all of that should not be there. Then talking about topography, yes, topography. Topography brings us to this, uh, to the, to this very diagram. We talked about uh, the water supply being able to move from uh, a point, a higher point up there at point A down to point B. Of course, you know if, if it's straight this way, let's say this is A, this is B, the water body here will be, okay, the water body here will be stagnated. Hmm? To be stagnated. But you see here, the water just flows freely. Okay, the water just keeps flowing. So, now, talking of topography talks about how high or low an area is. The topography of where you're sighting your fish pond should be such that a point is high enough to release the water and then the, the other point should be low enough to keep causing the free flow of water to be consistent along that line. Then we talk about availability of fast-growing fish. You don't want to get redundant uh, 
fishes, fishes that will not grow very quickly and then you keep them in your ponds and all you just keep doing is feeding them and they are not giving you the required meat or the required uh, uh, production. So you want fishes that will grow very quickly, fishes that will lay eggs within a very short period and boom, you know, the fingerlings are everywhere. You can have as many uh, of them as you want and you make good money. And then you also consider the availability of supplementary foodstuff. What do we mean by supplementary foodstuff? We, supplementary foodstuff, we're talking about other tiny uh, foods that you use to support the planktons. The planktons, like we said, are the natural food of fishes. Hmm? Natural fish feed. Okay? Natural fish feed. That's the planktons. Now, aside from the planktons, you should also make provision for other things that uh, the fish can feed on. You can also, to help to assist the planktons, you can also use the NPK fertilizer. Remember our NPK, which is a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, okay, mixed in the right, mixed in the right quantity to assist in the growth of the plankton so that the fish can have enough food to grow. Now, uh, being done with this, we'll move on to classification of fishes very quickly. So now, we will quickly consider classification of fishes. When we classify fishes, we do this usually based on two, uh, two, based on two uh, considerations. The first is based on habitat and the second is based on body structure of the fish or fishes. When we consider uh, the classification of fishes based on habitat, we are talking about their natural environment, that is where we can find these fishes. Based on the habitat, we can talk about we can talk about um, fresh water and then we can talk about salt water. So, of course, fresh water, you talk about the streams, you talk about the rivers, the ponds, the lakes, you know, those little bodies of water. And when we talk about salt water, we're talking about oceans, we're talking about um, bigger or larger bodies of water, basically the oceans um, and of course the, the oceans basically, yes. So now which fishes do we find in such places? In fresh water you find such fishes like the tilapia, the mudfish. Um, in fresh water, you find such fishes like the tilapia, the mudfish, the carp, the perch, and a number of them. Then in salt water, which is the oceans, you find such fishes like the shark, the dogfish, the dolphin, the whales, the tilapia too can be found in salt water. Okay, you can as well found, find tilapia here. So tilapia shares both environments. Now when we talk about the body structure of fishes, we're talking about the bony fishes and we are also talking about the cartilaginous cartilage cartilaginous okay 
We talk about the bony fishes and the cartilaginous fishes. The bony fishes, tilapia, in fact, the bony fishes are the same examples you have for the freshwater fish. Okay, so most of the bony fishes you find are in the freshwater habitat, while most of the cartilaginous fishes that you find are in the salt water environment. Tilapia is an exception here because tilapia is a bony fish. Always remember that. So, once again, classification of fishes. Fishes are classified into two, uh, are classified based on two broad descriptions. The first is based on their habitat, and the second is based on their body structure. Talking about habitat, we have the saltwater habitat, we have the freshwater habitat. The freshwater habitat fishes are often um, bony, bony structured fishes, while the cartilaginous fishes are often the salt water fishes. And what do we mean by cartilage? Cartilage is soft bone. Okay, we call it in the in the uh, normal or everyday parlance. We call it biscuit. Biscuit. Biscuit, biscuit bone, okay? You know that bone that is crunchy like biscuit, crook, 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 when you are chewing it, I mean you, you love to chew it. If you have a dog, you don't even want to throw it to the dog. Hmm? You want to enjoy the, the cartilage. So that's cartilaginous uh, fish, okay? The, the, the bone is crunchy just like biscuit. You can actually chew it. It's not very hard. So those fishes, the sharks, the whales, the dolphins, that is the kind of uh, structure that they have. And they are often found in the saltwater environment, while the bony structured fishes are often found in the uh, freshwater environment. But remember, tilapia shares both environments, the freshwater habitat as well as the salt water habitat and then we're done with that so we proceed to construction of a fish pond what are the things to be considered if you want to side or if you want to construct a fish pond good so we go on to look at the construction of a fish pond. When we are constructing a fish pond, the first thing to consider is site selection. We have dealt a little bit, uh, we've dealt with that a little bit, okay, in, the sub, in, a, in a previous subtitle or subtopic, okay, when we talked about factors necessary for sighting a fish pond. So you can go back to the video and refresh your memory on selection of site. But for emphasis, site to be selected should have little vegetation, site to be selected should be fertile, and site to selected should be able to retain water, okay? So uh, we sh here we should be talking about uh, fertile clay soil, okay? You know, clay soil is usually that soil that is able to retain water, but that clay soil should be fertile, good. So the next stage is you have selected your site, so what do you do? you will need the advice or the survey of specialists probably the extension workers you can invite them over to have a look see at the site that you have selected and make their own input based on 
the volume of water that will be there based on the height, based on topography and a number of other things. And of course, once they tick you good, then you're good to go. You begin to clear your site, you begin to remove storms of trees that may be there and all of that. You get the site cleaned up and cleared and then you go on to construct your dam. Okay, The dam is that place where you put water and then put fish okay it's we call it dam here because it's not a pond yet it's not a fish pond yet it's 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 just a dam when you're constructing it it's just a dam so you dig up the dam okay that is the area where the fish pond or where the water and the fish will be that is your dam you dig it up to the size that you want and then also beside it let's say at about right angles to the dam you will also be constructing what we call a trench a core trench what is the trench when you are removing uh, when you have to remove things from the pond you have to remove sand and all and all of that that trench is where you deposit things that you remove from the the trench is where you deposit things that you remove from the dam okay and uh, also from the fish pond when the fish pond is already in process so from time to time you may need to clear your trench then construction of the spillway the spillway is uh, the that the portion is a portion of the fish pond where water okay if if the water gets to a certain level it can actually uh leave through that uh, very part you, you you may also want to consider the outlet for the water because the water will not always be stagnant so the spillway here talks about the outlet okay for water and usually you need a screen of fine mesh you need a screen of fine mesh okay you need a screen of fine mesh to cover that very place so that when the water is leaving the spillway leaving through the spillway it doesn't carry your fishes along with it you know what I mean then impoundment of the pond good so we have constructed a dam we have uh, done the spillway to let water out at uh, whatever time or level we want the water to leave then the next thing to consider is impounding of the pond what do we mean by impounding of the pond we simply mean putting water into the pond okay introducing water good water okay the water of course should be shouldn't smell shouldn't be too colored should be able to uh, um, take sunlight into it uh, sunlight helps to helps the planktons to grow okay and also keeps the fish active so you impound your pond by introducing water into the pond and after that you may want to uh, uh, lime lime your Pond. What do we mean by liming of the pond? By liming of the pond, we we mean introducing things like uh, um, limestone, okay, limestone and uh, carbonates. These lime, the limestone and the carbonates, they are necessary for the growth of planktons. That is the fish food, and also they assist the fish in uh, in the absorption of carbon, uh, sorry, absor absorption of calcium. Of course, you know that calcium is good for the f for the bones of the fishes and for optimum growth. Then inoculation, inoculating the pond talks about introduction of planktons, planktons. Do you remember the planktons? They are the 
natural feed for the fishes. So you introduce plankton, so you can go to a, 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 another water body that already has plankton, okay? You can get them and then introduce these planktons into your own pond. And when you do that, you simply add fertilizers, okay? That's pond fertilization. You add fertilizers to boost the growth of the planktons. And then once that is done, you have your uh, food ready. I mean, you're not going to put the fish and then you begin to starve them. The food should be there because the moment you are ready to stock up your pond, stocking up the pond means introducing the fishes into the pond. The moment you're ready to introduce the fishes into the pond, the fishes are going to dive into the water and do what? Start eating and you know nibbling at the planktons and whatever food or whatever feed you may have in, uh, introduced into the water before bringing in the fishes. So that uh, these are basically the 10 steps you must consider in construction of a fish pond. First, sele uh, site selection. Second, survey or reconnaissance. Third, clearing and stomping. Fourth, construction of a dam and trench. Fifth, construction of a spillway, which is the outlet for water. Impoundment of the pond, which is the sixth, that is introducing water into the pond. Seventh, introducing cal uh, calcium carbonate, uh, lime and calcium carbonate uh, nutrients. And then third, you inoculate, introduce planktons, and then pond fertilization is the ninth. And the final is you now stock up your pond with fishes. Now, let us look at the regular practices that a fish farmer must imbibe if his business must uh, be productive and fruitful. The first thing here to consider is regular feeding. At no point should the fishes starve. So there should be constant food for the fishes. Moving on, the weeding. The weeding is closely linked to aeration because removing of weeds will assist the pond in being able to get enough oxygen from the atmosphere. When there's a lot of weed on the pond, it prevents the penetration of oxygen into the uh, into the pond and that is where you now start seeing fishes coming from the bottom of the pond to the top of the pond you know dipping out their mouth and trying to catch some air so weeds should be constantly removed and also uh, other things in order to aid better aeration um, there should be constant regular harvesting okay if the if the stocking if the if the fishes are over if the pond is overstocked with fishes the fishes will not get enough air so and of course also if the fishes are growing at a very fast rate they should be regularly harvested to create space for the fishes to get enough air so um we've taken care of these and uh, this, then there should be constant supply of water, just like we said before. The water should be constant. At no point should the water dry. That is the very reason for wanting to, the very reason for choosing clay soil, a soil that can retain water. And away from that, we did talk about the introduction of lime okay at some point in the previous subtopic lime also assists in blocking pores okay away from helping the growth of planktons and uh, fishes okay it also helps to block the pores of the pond of the pond so that water does not drain through those pores 
uh, calcium carbonate limestone helps to block those spores. So there should be constant supply of water, control of predators. Good. So control of predators. The natural predators of fishes, okay, in a fish pond, you have snakes, you have birds, okay, snakes, birds, especially. So what do you do? You make sure that the surroundings of the pond is neat, clean, okay, and clear of these predators so that they don't go eating up your fish. And then disease prevention. Disease prevention, weeding, okay, should be regularly done to prevent diseases or these weeds introducing diseases into your ponds and also maintaining of the optimum temperature for the fishes. So regulation of temperature, this could be done by of course, constant uh, uh, supply of water, making sure that the supply of water is copious and not uh, being, ex uh, being overly retained in the pond. That could raise the temperature above the normal temperature that is suitable for the fishes. Then regular harvesting, we have talked about that. Your, you should not allow your pond to be overcrowded. So your your pond should be regularly harvested. Take the fish out, take the fishes out, sell them, make your money. And then finally, regular application of fertilizers at least once a month. At least once a month, apply fertilizers to your pond. That will help the growth of natural fish feed, that is the planktons, remember? So at least once a month, apply fertilizers to your pond. And then we go on to the second to the last. On our list, which is a processing stroke, preservation of fish. And um, finally, we will consider harvesting of fish. Processing and preservation of fish. The first here is salting, and you will agree with me that salting is basic in any uh, process that we may want to that we may want our fish to undergo. Salting helps to prevent the growth of organisms or unwanted uh, organisms or okay uh, bacteria and that's and all that stuff around the fish so when you salt the fish you're simply preventing any growth of external or unwanted organism on the fish and of course basically you may want to salt your fish before uh, before you uh, smoke or before you do any other thing and then smoking Smoking simply talks about using fire, okay, to reduce the moisture content of the fish and also to uh, heat it up. Then sun drying is the use of sun, the, 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 the sunlight, okay, and here the fish is usually, um, it's, it's, it's usually preserved for just a short period, okay, it's for a short period. That is because the sun may not do enough job for you in, uh, in the complete drying of the fish. Then freezing. Freezing talks about the use of uh, refrigerators, okay, deep freezers and all of that. Cold rooms, most of the time you have gone to, or you may have followed your mom to the to a cold room to buy uh, fish and you see that the cold room is always cold, always frozen and the fish always, the fish are always frozen too. And then canning, you may have at some point uh, eaten that sardine, you know that one that 
is in a can you have to tear it open and then pour it out and use it for your bread and other or whatever other meal you may want to accompany the sardine with so canning is also a method for preservation of fish we will now go on to look at methods of harvesting fishes all right very quickly let us look at the methods of uh, harvesting fishes and when we talk about harvesting fishes we're simply talking about the implements the gears the equipment that are used in collecting fishes from the pond basically fishing nets are the top the very top on our lists of gears to be considered and that is why that is because fishing nets are the most abundant you have such as a scoop net okay just take a look at your screen these are very nets are being displayed the scoop net the gill net the sign net the trawlers and of course the baskets all of these nets are in various sizes and various degrees depending on the size of fish that you want to harvest for instance the gill net usually traps the fish around the neck okay around the gill region that, where you have the gill around the neck so of course the smaller fishes will pass through the the mesh of the net while the bigger fishes will get to that neck you know when, when it moves when it goes through when it pushes its head through the the hole in the net when it pushes its head through of course you know the head of the fish is something like a, a triangle and then it gets to this place okay this is where you probably have the eye so as the neck gets to this place that is uh, a bit wider it gets stuck and then the fish keeps trying to push keeps trying to push through but sorry all to no avail keeps trying to push through and then when he wants to pull back the gills the, the, the this is the head okay where you have the gills it hooks so the fish can't go forward the fish can't come back so you have all the sizes of fish okay that are actually within that range you have them all stock okay just like that in the net a lot of them the smaller fishes can pass through and then you have the uh, of course the sign the sign net that one is a much bigger net it's usually used for uh, total harvesting of the pond it's very wide and very big it has floaters okay it has floaters at the top and it has sinkers at the bottom the sinkers will take the net down to the bottom of the pond while the uh, floaters will keep the sides of the net up so that when the fishes come or swim into the net that is wide open all you just need to do is pull it okay pull the tops together and all the fishes will collect within the net and you pull the net out and take your fishes trawlers are usually attached to boats as the boats are moving okay the trawlers are harvesting the fishes the baskets are much smaller okay they are much smaller just like the scoop nets they are used to harvest smaller fishes and then you have the hook and the line you know i, I remember back then when i used to go fishing with friends I, I was very little then and you can imagine me i just take my bait you know the hook okay uh, this is the line and uh, you have the sorry this is your your stick and then you have the line okay the line then you have the the hook okay the hook is like this usually the hook is uh, 
has has a, something like a spike. This is where the fish puts its mouth and then in trying to remove it, it hooks it and then you pull it out. But before sinking this hook into the water, you will normally add a bit, bait like earthworm for instance. So usually you see the earthworm, okay, inside, inside, okay, the hook. So what the fish does is the fish comes and nibbles at the earthworm, nibbles at the earthworm, that is the bait now, okay, this is the hook, this is the line, this is your handle, okay, and now this is the bait. So the fish comes, nibbles at the bait, nibbles at the bait, keeps nibbling until it gets to where the hook is without knowing it nibbles into the hook and the hook hooks it. And when the hook hooks it, I bet you the fish can still escape. Yes, the fish can still escape. So when it nibbles to the end of the bait and then into the hook, you start to see the line. You start to feel pressures around the line. But I didn't know that at that point, all I needed to do was, you know, raise the hook with such force that the, 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 the spike on the hook can go into the jaw of the fish and then it will have nowhere to run to, no, men, no means of escaping. I had no idea. So I'll just leave my... my I mean, my hook or my line, I, I, I just keep feeling it. And then when I stop feeling the pressure, I would say, oh, the fish is now dead. The fish doesn't die on the hook. And then, little me, I will now pull out my hook, my line and everything, and I will see no fish. The fish has escaped. Okay? So, the fish does not die on the hook. So the moment you start to feel the pressure, the movement on the line, okay, you start to see it. What the fish is actually trying to do at that point is the fish knows that, oh, there's danger. I've got to escape. And the fish is pulling, pulling, pulling and trying to run away. Don't let it run away. Pull out immediately and you'll catch the fish. When the fish is out, that is when you can kill it. That's how the hook and line works. And then talking about draining the ponds. Draining the ponds also has to do with total harvesting. Okay? In that case, you want to room, get all the fish out of the pond and, you know, do massive sales. Okay? So you drain all the water from the ponds and just clear off the fishes. The other method is electrofishing. In electrofishing, you have to create, you have to uh, select a site, okay, where you will create an electric field, okay, the positive and the negative ends of the of the of the, of the electric uh, field, okay, within that positive and uh, negative ends of the of these uh, poles. All the fish within that environment will be electrocuted. And of course, being electrocuted means being dead. And then when that happens, you just, okay, get your fishes out. As simple as that. Then we talk about the use of ultrasonic sounds. You know, fishes, they, when you make those ultrasonic sounds, it attracts the fishes. So those fishes will come together pull together, collect together in a very, in, in, in a particular uh, port or at a particular spot and you just scoop them off the pond. That is another method. And then we also have the impaling. Impaling, uh, you, there, there are, you can use um, uh, javelin for instance. You know the, the the javelin is 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 much like a spear, okay, with a very sharp end. So you impale the fish using the javelin. You 
Okay, you can throw it. There are also uh, there's also another one called the harpoon. Okay, the harpoon does not have uh, just one point. It can have about three points. Okay, three sharp points. And of course, you can throw it, but it's used for catching big fishes, very big, like shark. Okay, but I mean, well, maybe not a not a big shark. Okay, because the shark can take you off with your harpoon, and you find yourself in the very heart of the ocean. All right, so these are the methods of harvesting fishes. We have looked uh, this. Um, we have looked at so far at uh, fish farming, okay. And these are the various subtopics that we have considered on the fish farming. We have considered the definition, the Im and importance. We've looked at the factors for siting a fish pond, okay. You have to select your site, your soil, topography. Um, and all that and then we looked at the classification of fishes when we said there are two basic uh, broad categories of the of classifications we looked at classification based on habitat classification based on the structure of the fish based on habitat we have the freshwater habitat and we have the saltwater habitat based on structure we have the bony structured fishes and we have the cartilaginous fishes okay we saw the examples uh, and we said that basically the bony structured fishes are also found in the freshwater fishes while the cartilaginous fishes are often found in the uh, uh, salt water fishes except of course for the tilapia, basically the tilapia, which you can find in both habitats. We looked at the construction of, uh, of, of fish pond, the maintenance of fish pond, processing and preservation of fish, uh, where we talked about smoking, canning, salting, um, sun drying, and then we finally have ended this topic by looking at the methods of harvesting fish, which of course, you can still see on the board. We looked at the various um, gears that are used, implements, equipment used in harvesting of fishes. And with that, we come to the end of this topic, which is fish farming. A uh, few questions will be displayed on your screen. Do well to attend them. And if you have questions, please feel free to replay the video.